Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and welcome to this session entitled Square Meters and the New Generation. Uh, this is not a conventional panel with short presentations and then a roundtable discussion. The four speakers that you see here will each be giving a brief 15-minute talk instead. I'll be giving a short introduction to each one of them as they take their turn to speak, so I'll just say now that the session will include detailed references to the residential, retail, hospitality, and serviced office sectors, and their relationship to the new generation. I'll now start things off with my own presentation, which is on the theme, Millennials Don't Exist, People Exist. The presentation will be in three parts, brief introduction to the conventional view of a Generation Y, also known as the Millennials, my own take on these stereotypes, and finally, a look at some implications for developers here in the audience. So who are these uh, Millennials then? Generally accepted as having been born between 1980 and the turn of the century, they've uh, recently been in the news because they've become the largest generation in the workplace in the United States by numbers. But there are also a number of constantly repeated stereotypes about this particular generation. One of the most frequently mentioned is that they are really tech savvy, that they like technology, because they are the first generation to have grown up with the PCs and with the internet. And they certainly like their iPhones, as you'll see in this cartoon. Another characteristic is that they are enthusiastic users of the sharing economy. Owning the asset is not the priority for them. Uh, but so some of the best known business names of today have roots in the sharing philosophy. People like Uber, Netflix, and Airbnb, for example. Millennials are also supposed to be reacting against big brands and globalization and in favor of local, unique, and independent suppliers. And finally, they are much more likely to be concerned by green issues as they are the first generation to have been made aware of the environment from childhood onwards. And now I'd like to take some of these stereotypes and test them to see if they are in fact unique to millennials or if they in fact apply to most of us. Millennials may be the largest generation numerically, but they're still a minority in the marketplace. And how could you possibly call this group, aged 12 to 36, a single market anyway? Actually, there are millennials out there who have millennial children. who can't possibly think of them as one monolithic block. Also, they're not the wealthiest group in either annual spending or in their saved up capital something that I think is perhaps of more interest to retailers and developers. And how about their reputation for being technological experts? These days, you just have to drag a file to copy it. These days, even babies can use iPads. The previous generation had to learn this lot before they could even copy a file from one disk to another. And these graphs show that millennials are not even significantly more likely to use modern hardware or software than the previous generation. In fact, tablet computers are more used by Generation X than Generation Y, perhaps because they're more expensive. Research also shows that millennials are putting off many major life decisions, but that when they do achieve financial independence, then they buy houses and cars with the same relish as earlier generations. It just takes a little longer Sometimes because, although the latest generations may well be the best educated in history, many of them are also leaving university burdened with high levels of student debt and emerging into a workplace in a world that seems to be in continual financial crisis. And turning to the image of millennials preferring independence to the big brands, again, it's interesting that research shows that when the financial means does come to them, they prefer exactly the same brands as those of other generations. On the left, the brands that the millennials like, and on the right, the brands that everybody else likes. So to sum up this part of the talk, millennials are not a monolith. They are widely diverse. The world is moving on. Millennials are part of that trend, part of each trend, not the trend themselves. And as one uh, well-known speaker, and in fact a millennial himself said, millennials are people. That's all you really need to know. So what are the implications? What can developers and operators expect from these new trends? Firstly, let's talk a little bit about the hardware, spaces, and design. One consequence of the financial crisis, the difficulties of younger consumers, 
and increasingly expensive land in city centers is a reduction in space standards. Apartments, hotel rooms are all getting smaller to reuse capital, purchase, and running costs. Smaller units, but in a lively and exciting neighborhood, might be a good compromise. It may only be a matter of time before we come to this, but in the meantime, younger buyers are increasingly enjoying the virtues of a compact but stylish and clever design, giving contemporary lifestyle without the usual price tag that that would imply. As you can see, that little box on the right-hand side contains a bedroom, a bathroom, and an office. And developers are compensating for these smaller space standards by offering well-designed common areas with a variety of uses. In this development, which is mostly studios and one-bedroom apartments, you can see a fireplace, a TV room, a billiards table, lounge areas, and there's even a coffee bar and a private dining room. Another trend is the combining of underused hotel spaces, like the foyer, the check-in desk, the lounge, the bar, and the breakfast room. This ticks quite a lot of boxes. It reduces size, it reduces capital costs, it reduces staffing costs, and yet it increases guest interaction with both the hotel and with each other. Also, hotels are starting to outsource loss-making departments like fine dining restaurants and fitness spaces to third parties, again reducing costs but improving the guest experience by widening the customer base and handing over operations to true experts in those fields. Turning now from uh, spaces and design to marketing, some big names are getting around the trend away from uh, big brands, away from chains, and towards individual and unique operations by creating unbranded environments. This is a very successful pop-up bar and restaurant on top of a five-star hotel in central London. In fact, it's a Marriott product, but there is absolutely no branding anywhere within the restaurant, not even at the front door which is in an anonymous side street. Another example of corporate modesty, as we all know, especially here in Istanbul, the coffee world has moved on from the big name chains with the opening of a number of so-called third wave coffee shops, independent, sophisticated, and individual, just like the millennials are supposed to want. And now big name coffee has responded with its own take on the third wave. This is an upmarket spin-off by Starbucks in Los Angeles but the famous green logo is nowhere to be seen. Malls are also going to see increasing blurring of the sectors as retailers try to connect more with their public and offer experiences as opposed to mere products. Here, for example, we've got a, a music shop which is selling coffee, and here is a coffee shop selling music and much more. Supermarkets are selling financial products and a food store here that is also a restaurant this is Italy, and there's one right here in the Zorlu Center. Another management issue that connects many of these new trends, technology, social networking, enhancing the customer experience, is the use of uh, geolocation to engage with the customer, social, local, and mobile. Hotels and residence occupancies can download their own app to order services, make reservations, make payments, get local information, and even share feedback and recommendations with their fellow travelers or residents. On the other side, hotel operators can use CRM apps to create and maintain a relationship with their customer, engaging with them from the moment the reservation has been made, through the pre-arrival stage, during the stay, and even afterwards for feedback. For malls and airports and uh, conference halls, so low mode geolocation apps are already in use, providing wayfinding, information about opening times, movie guides, and uh, news of special offers. And the final emerging trend that I want to mention, blurring the boundaries between the physical and the virtual shopping experience, is the emergence of social media as a platform for buying. This add-on to Instagram enables someone who likes a product that they see on Instagram to click through to the vendor and make an immediate purchase. Ibrahim, I think, is going to touch on this a little bit more detail in his own presentation. And these trends, all of these trends that I've mentioned, are by no means limited to millennials. Everyone is benefiting from them. Okay, this is not a comment on the world financial situation. It's just a reminder to everyone that I have to get on, a reminder to me that I have to get on with it. So finally, one big caveat, one big warning. 
There is a belief that trends start in America, specifically California, actually, before spreading out across the United States and around the world. But we must always bear in mind local culture and preferences as well. Not every trend is going to be equally valid everywhere. Software apps are relatively easy to implement and update, but getting a building concept wrong is much more costly. A couple of examples, uh, smaller unit sizes for to take one. Small place, some places like London, Manhattan, Tokyo, and Hong Kong have long since got used to small apartments, even beds that fold away into the wall. But in Turkey, these are presently more acceptable for investment than for living, we think. This trend may need a little, little, may need a little more time here. And a final example, two of the most exciting sub-markets for residential development in Europe and the US are for studios for singles and retirement housing for the very old. But in Turkey, the family unit is much stronger, the pensions rather smaller, and so there is presently much less demand for this kind of independent living, another trend that may take a while to get here or may never reach here indeed at all. Okay, I think that's more or less the end of my time allowance, so time to sign off. I'm not a millennial, but uh, just to show that we baby boomers still know how to use a real computer, I'm going to sign off in the old-fashioned way. Thank you very much indeed. And now I would like to invite Mr. Anthony Doucette to make his presentation. Anthony is responsible for the marketing and branding of two very individual and innovative hotel groups right here in Turkey. And he'll be talking about the expectations of the new traveler. Merhaba, hoş geldiniz. I will speak in English. My uh, Turkish is not that good, despite I'm eight years in Turkey. Um, so I work for a house hotel in Cloud7. I came to Turkey eight years ago. House Hotel and Cloud7 is uh, carried by um, a private equity called Care10. Uh, and we are um, uh, supposedly ap appealing brands for the millennials. So I will speak, I mean, you will hear uh, a lot in this uh, session about millennials. Um, there are some good news about the millennials and there are some bad news. Um, but before, I need to take a picture to feed my Instagram because it's my... Yeah. Good. <laughs> so, millennial... Uh, I'm trying to put this next slide. Ah, this one. Good. Okay, the good news is millennial is not an, an age. It's more a state of mind. So, people say, yeah, it's 18, 30. Uh, no, it's not 1830. I'm 46, I'm a millennial, and I'm sure in that room, uh, many people are behaving like millennials. Um, this lady, her name is Iris Apfel. She's an interior designer, a businesswoman, and lately she's a fashion icon. She's 94 years old. She's the brand ambassador for many brands, including MAC uh, Cosmetics at her age, 94. So, uh, you will see through this presentations, maybe, I don't know if my colleagues agree, but for me, millennial is not a, an age, it's more a, a state of mind. So that you need to integrate that it's on a, not the, the future hotels, that are not only for the people who are 18 or 30, but they are the people who are behaving like them, like myself. Um, so what is the behavior of millennials or the people who are sharing their values uh, for the hospitality industry and in general? Um, people are spending less and less uh, money in material things. They want to, they're spending more um, money in experiences. People are not anymore happy with uh, expensive stuff. They are more uh, willing to spend their money in experiences. It can be a trip, um, it can be anything. This, so this is why it's a very uh, good opportunity for the uh, hotel sector. If you can provide those experiences to uh, those, uh, those, those clients, you'll be successful. Of course, they want digital convenience, and they want uh, relevant information on social media. Uh, they can smell marketing, and they can smell lie uh, 
from miles away. So you need to be very transparent about your brand, about your products on any platform uh, you are present. Uh, and because those millennials are traveling uh, more than the previous generation, or because also the cost of the transportation is less, people are traveling more, but they're spending the same budget through the year. So because they're traveling more, so they're uh, giving less uh, allocation to, for example, hotels. Uh, because they don't want to stay in the hotel so long, they want to experience the hotel all around. Um, 40, 50 years ago, when all these big brands, Hilton, Hyatt, Sheraton, um, came, it was for a reason, because people were starting to travel the world. So people, they wanted to be in a very secure environment. Um, now, people, they don't, especially the new generations, they don't want to spend a lot of time in the hotel. They want to experience around the hotel. This is why the rooms are getting uh, smaller. They don't I mean, before people were really scared to travel. Now, the new generation, they don't care to eat street food in the, next to the, to the hotel. They don't care about food poisoning or those kinds. They, it's almost part of the experience. Um, and technology, of course, is the seven sense. So we created that brand uh, that I mentioned, Cloud7, because of this uh, seven sense. So we all have uh, five sense. Uh, six sense is the gut feeling. And the seventh sense is technology. And the reason we gave that uh, seventh sense technology, uh, I read, uh, before we came up with this brand, Cloud7, we read a lot of stuff about those bloody millennials. Um, and 65% of them would rather give the sense of smell rather than giving their phone. I know it sounds scary, but that's what it is. So everything in new hotels need to be super mobile friendly. Um, so some big brands already are coming with some uh, concept tailoring those needs. Uh, you will see them in the next slides. The first one is Canopy by Hilton. They will open 20 rooms by the end of this year. Uh, Moxie by Marriott, they already have opened um, six hotels and they have dozens in the, in the pipelines. Elements uh, by Westins, this one is a bit different, it's more for extended stay, they have kitchen and also they're very oriented into um, green um, environments, so they're really like green oriented. And the last one, it opened two weeks ago. MR Hospitality just launched two weeks ago this uh, new uh, hotel brands, Rove Hotels, uh, to cater uh, those new generation. Also, Dubai needs this kind of uh, hotels because it's, um, I mean, when you go to Dubai, it's, you have plenty of five-star hotels, but when you come to mid-market uh, hotel segments, it's quite empty, so Rove is uh, going to fill that market. Um, actually, some more independent brands already started a few years ago. Uh, Citizen M, uh, they have uh, now six hotels, also uh, some more in the pipeline, mostly in uh, Europe, but they have one in New York on Times Square, and they're planning to open uh, more in the United States. Uh, Mama Shelter, they have four in France, and they open one in uh, Los Angeles. Generator, uh, it's also a big uh, hospi hospitality trend. It's those uh, luxury hostel. Um, so you have the normal dorms with six, eight beds, but they also have individual rooms, and they have huge social areas, and they even attract business travelers. And they're so busy that sometimes they're charging, I don't know, 25, 35, especially I checked the price at the one they have in Venice. They're charging 35, sometimes 55 euro just for a bed that you're sharing with, uh, for a room that you're sharing with eight other people. So if you multiply eight by 35 or 55, you can already calculate the revenue per room. It's almost the revenue that you're getting in a, in a four-star hotel in Venice. So it's very smart concept. This is us, uh, Cloud7. 
this is our front desk. You will see in the next slide that front desk are disappearing. So we are, oh, we opened uh, the first one in Atakei uh, two weeks ago. I think our landlord is in that room. And we are going to open more in Istanbul and in the Gulf uh, region because we can see the need in that, in that region. So that's how we're going to look the front desk in the future. Because of that uh, technology, you don't need anymore uh, to give your credit cards and your passport, and you're just going to sit there. That's what we're doing at uh, Cloud7. Um, first, you receive the internet code before you check in, because the first time millennials want to have when they check in in the hotel, it's internet. They traveled for, I don't know, four, five, six, eight hours without being connected. For them, it's years. So the first thing they want is to get connected. So they receive all the messages and the information about uh, uh, getting connection uh, through mobile. And then they sit wherever they want in that social space, and someone is coming to you uh, to do your check-in. First, you did your check-in, uh, if you want, the day before. Um, so the, the, the, the whole process of checking with credit, the credit card, you already gave your credit cards at reservation, at check-in, at checkout. No, millennials, they don't want to stay in line for a desk. They just want a smooth check-in. So if you give your credit card once, you don't need to give your credit card a second time and a third time. Uh, this is why we don't need any more uh, front desk. And you're not making any money with front desk and with, the, uh, with, with lobbies. So that's also the... The focus on those new brands is to make every square meters profitable. Uh, Co-branded experience. Um, I think there is a, um, a big uh, failure in the big hotel brand is restaurants. Most of those big hotels uh, with restaurants are, not all of them, but I would say the majority of them are failing with, uh, with their restaurants. Um, because they're not attracting the local uh, environments. Um, so they first start, they're a bit shy in the hospitality, uh, traditional hospitality business. They're doing consultancy with some chefs, but still not working because the chef is coming, making the menu, is coming two, three times to check uh, during the year, getting his uh, fees, and then everybody's uh, disappearing. Um, so what it's better now is to, like, hotel brands are focusing on, on rooms, and then you're giving the uh, other space to professionals, coffees, restaurants. Room service also, it's rarely a profitable uh, uh, services in big hotels, like minibars. Um, so room service will also, in some hotels, will disappear uh, uh, bit by bit. The Hilton in New York, 2,000 rooms, just took out room service uh, two months ago. In order to maximize the, your um, ground space, you can also put retail space. Um, I mean, lo empty lobby, also a lobby doesn't make any money, but retail space make money. You can give some, uh, if you have enough space, you can give the space to, to a shop. What we did in Cloud7, because we don't have so much uh, space in the one in Atakei, we have a window here where we have curated gift from, uh, from uh, Istanbul, and people can buy, and it's working pretty well, and we're getting a commission out of those uh, sales. Uh, same, we don't have room service, but we have this grab-and-go uh, service. So how rooms will uh, look in the coming years? Um, you will see less and less bathtub in hotels. Um, showers are more common. Um, everything in the room needs to be controlled by the a tablet, which is in the room, or even better, now hotels start to do it. Citizen M is doing it. You can uh, control, uh, you can open the room with your mobile. You can um, control the light with the mobile. You can close the curtain with the mobile. You can control the air condition with your mobile. Um, so this is a big trend. No more carpets. Um, millennials don't like carpets, and also it's not very hygienic, so more uh, hard surface. Desks are getting smaller and smaller. Um, so 
they are getting uh, in some some brands they are even disappearing and people are uh, hotels are propping a lap desk so because people now work on their beds on their uh, lap uh, closets uh, you don't need to spend so much money on closets now everything is open space even the closets you like millennials they don't have anything to hide uh, so you're going to spend more money in tech less money in marbles and in Close it. This is why I would say there is good news and bad news. Bad news, you're going to spend less money in hotels, in physical things, but you will spend some more money on technology. Um, but if you're making that switch, then you will be, I mean, hotels will be more appealing to this generation. More digital in the room. Um, we have that at Cloud7. You can connect your uh, phone uh, with the TV, so you can, whatever you have on your phone, you can connect to your TV. Is also in some hotels you also have arts, changing arts. Um, another emerging trend in room uh, fitness. Um, so you have some hotels, they have some weights in the room, a yoga mat uh, or an exercise ball. Uh, it's becoming quite common. Uh, Worker shorter, that's a new term to to describe this life change. Um, before you had the business hotels and you had leisure hotels. But now it's becoming very confusing because the business travelers, they want experiences also when they're in business. They want to have fun, they want to experiences. And now the leisure travelers, they are working during their vacation. They're not disconnected with their work. So that's why you need to, the next hotels needs to be appealing to both leisure and business traveler at the same time. The segmentation doesn't exist anymore. And there's a brand which is doing this uh, very well. They just have one hotel now in Amsterdam. It's called Zoku. And the room is not centered around the bed. The room is centered around the kitchen and the dining table. So the room can be an office, can be a um, dining room, can be a room, uh, it can be, it's multi-purpose. Um, so that's going to be my last slide and conclusion. Um, that's the conclusion for the trends. So authenticity and locality, I think it's very important in the new hotels um, to integrate the neighborhoods uh, where you are. Uh, at the House Hotel, for example, in Caracay, we did collaboration with uh, local artists to integrate uh, art into the hotel. Uh, Co-working are coming to hotel lobbies. You have um, a building. Maybe you shouldn't have only one hotel. Maybe you're going to have a co-working space, a hotel, a residence, a retail. The gym, as, uh, uh, as Tony said, the gym um, are getting outsourced because it's not a profit center. But if you outsource it, it's becoming a profit uh, center because they can manage outside members, so it's, some, it's also uh, generating uh, profits. As I said before, multifunction uh, lobbies uh, for, uh, to be appealing to everyone. Uh, for Atakeuil, we saw that big lobbies it was too big, uh, so there was an, an idea of our uh, landlords. So, okay, let's integrate a cafe. So what you see here is the new Cafe du Nyasi in Atakeuil. It's not a cafe, it's not a hotel lobby, it's both of them. And uh, as I said, people are spending less and less money in hotels, uh, in, in the rooms. So rooms are getting, uh, are getting smaller. Thank you. Uh, one moment, uh, one question if I may. Uh, you've described a lot of software and hardware trends, but the major five-star brands today seem to prefer to invent a new brand, a new sub-brand rather than change their core products. Uh, do you think that developers here who may have hotel projects should be thinking of these new millennial sub-brands, or should they still be staying with the big five-star uh, brands for their projects? Um, I think there is a space for everyone. I think it's not the end of luxury hotels, because I may stay in any of those mid-market brands one day, but the next day I want to indulge myself and stay at the Raffles, spend the weekend, and enjoy the spa, do some shopping. As long as there is an experience attached to it, 
um, I think there is space for everyone. Maybe the only thing we should change in the big hotel brands is this restaurant concept. I think the all-day dining uh, is totally dead. They should really partner with professional restaurateurs who will make their, uh, their restaurants uh, more successful and that's uh, maximize the profits. Thanks very much. Thank Okay, now I'd like to invite Mr. Ahmet Honor to the uh, lectern. Ahmet is the founder of one of Turkey's newest and most dynamic serviced office co-working companies. And he has the big advantage today of being a genuine millennial. Öncelikle bir millennial olarak karşınıza çıkıyorum. Bir garip hissediyor insan bu kadar konuşulduktan sonra. Çünkü hakikaten böyle çok uzak bir dünyadan gelen yeni bir jenerasyon diye anlatılıyoruz. Ama bugün ben hak e, ki çok da doğru üstüne de bastık. Hakikaten bu milenyallarda neye dikkat etmek lazım? Ben bunu birkaç veriyle anlatmak istiyorum. Şu an günümüzde neler oluyor ve son 10 yılda neler oldu? E, Amerika'da sadece şu anda 53 milyon tane freelancer çalışan var. Freelancer çalışan derken bu kişiler ya bir yerden artık bağımsız, kendi başlarına şahısları atına fatura kesip çalışıyorlar ya da bir yerlere bağlılar ve çıkıp akşamları gerçekten bir Uber araba kullanıyorlar ya da başka herhangi oluşan bir pazarda ikinci bir gelir kaynağı yaratıyorlar. Ama 53 milyon kişiden bahsediyoruz. Şu anda Amerika'nın iş popülasyonunun %38'i oldu. Burada artık trend değil, gerçekten günümüzün bir gerçeğinden bahsediyoruz. 40 startup. Bu sayıdan çok daha fazla startup var. Ama şu anda dünyada 40 startup var ki şirket değerleri 1 milyar doların üstünde, kurucularının yaş ortalaması da 26'nın altında. Daha doğrusu hepsi 26 yaşının altında. Yani düşünün ki 40 milyar dolar şu anda 25, 24, 23, 26 yaşlarındaki kişilerce yönetiliyor. Yani burada aslında sadece popülasyona değil, bu değere ve burada oluşan yeni piyasalara da bakmak lazım. Ve hepinizin bildiği gibi ve çok konuştuğumuzca, Mobilite. Burada en büyük paydaş tabii ki teknoloji. Teknoloji sayesinde şu anda 1.3 milyar mobil çalışanlar var. Bunların çoğu hepimizin tanıdığı büyük kurumlara bağlı mobil çalışanlar. Yani ofiste fiziksel olarak kalması gerekmeden çalışmasını yürüten ve belki daha bile verimli olan, büyük bir ihtimalle daha verimli olan çok büyük bir popülasyondan bahsediyoruz. Bu şirketlere teker teker konuşmadan önce bu millennial konusunu bir yerde toparlamak istiyorum. Aslında yeni gelen şey girişimcilik ruhunu tetikleyecek cesareti bulmuş bir jenerasyon var. Çünkü aramızdaki herkes gençken bir hayali vardı. Herkes 23 yaşında milyarder, dolar, milyarder olmak isterdi. Eminim bu hepimizin paylaştığı bir hayal. Ama bu eskiden çok mümkün değildi. Benim bu jenerasyona söylediğim ve genellediğim tek bir şey var. Artık girişimci ruha sahip bir jenerasyonla karşı karşıyayız. Yani bu kişiler gerektiğinde çıkıp bir freelancer olmaya, olma kadar cesur. Gerektiğinde kendi iş fikrini için hayatını ortaya atacak ve bu hayali gerçekleştirecek kadar cesur. Ya da artık şirketlerde kurum içi girişimciliğe hakim olabilirsiniz. Kurumlar da artık bu ruhu kendi içlerinde canlandırıyorlar. Neden? Çünkü son 10 yılda YouTube televizyon piyasasını Yerde bir etti. Yani yepyeni bir pazar oluşturdu. LinkedIn ise İK'yı. Airbnb artık otellerden bahsediyoruz. Dev otelin yanında bir apartman dairesi otelden müşteri çalabiliyor. Simple şu anda belki duymamışsınız. Diğerleri daha ünlü örnekler. Simple Banking şu anda hiçbir şubesi olmayan Amerika'da ama 55 bin ATM'de bankacılık işlemleri yürüten bir şirket. Ve varsayım şu ki ileride bankacılık sektöründen de bir pay alacak ya da bir banka tarafından satın alınacak. MakerBot da gene öyle. 3D Printing'i ilk defa evlere sokan yeni bir şirket. Bu da perakende alışkanlıklarını inanılmaz seviyede değiştiriyor. Uber'i tanıyorsunuz. Bu yolculuk tecrübesini enteresan bir noktaya çekti. Tesla da gene büyük örneklerden araba sektöründe enteresan bir pazar payı aldı. Şimdi bu şirketlerin... Hepsinin yaptığı en önemli konu çok hızlı sürede pazarlarına hakim olduğunu düşünen dev şirketlerden inanılmaz oranlarda hisse pazar payı alarak bu pazarlara kendilerini soktular. Bu da aslında inovasyonun ve artık bu oldurma gücünün 
e, yeniliklerin ne kadar hızlı geldiğini gösteriyor. Bizim uzman olduğumuz e, bir konuya şimdi gireceğiz. Peki ofis dünyası, bugünün önemi de bu. Gayrimenkule bağlı olan en büyük, yani perakende ofis konut diyoruz. Ofis dünyası şu ana kadar konuştuğumuz çerçevede nerede duruyor? Ofis dünyası nasıl değişiyor? Ve ofis dünyasında nasıl bir inovasyon bizi bekliyor? Şu ana kadar ofis dediğimde eminim ki hiçbirinizde çok sıcak hisler uyandırılmıyordur. Bunun tek nedeni ofisin kendisi değil, tabii iş yükü ve profesyonel hayatın stresi olabilir. Ama ofislere de baktığımızda şu kareye alışık olduğumuz siyah beyaz bir ofis ortamını görüyoruz. Ama 8, şanslıysak 8, şanssızsak da 12, 16, bazen 24 saatimizi harcadığımız bir alandan bahsediyoruz. Acaba burası bize çok daha farklı bir ilişki geliştirebilir mi? İşte bu soruyla beraber şu anda karşımıza çıkan yepyeni bir piyasa var. Aramızdan kaç kişi co-working lafını duymuştu? Yarımız diyebiliriz. Co-working, ortak çalışma veya ben yeni nesil ofisler diyorum. Nasıl yeni nesil otellerden bahsettiysek, bu da artık ofisin kabuk attığı bir versiyon. Co-working nasıl işliyor? Gençler dedik, freelancerlar dedik, butik şirketler, startuplar dedik. Bunların aslında drive ettiği bir piyasa, piyasa co-working. Ve bir an canlandıralım, normal bir ofis tutma tecrübesini. Emlakçılar, binalar, fiyatlar, pazarlıklar, büyük kontratlar, bir yıl göbek bağlamalar belki işin nereye gideceği belli değil. Türkiye'nin nereye gideceği belli değil bir yıla. Ama siz gidip bir yıl boyunca ben burayı bu şekilde tutacağım diye söz veriyorsunuz. Aslında siz de emin değilsiniz o yıl boyunca. Belki daha büyük bir ofis tutuyorsunuz, o gün öyle bir ihtiyacınız yok. Coworking'de ise çok daha esnek bir şekilde. İsterseniz bir gün, isterseniz üç ay, isterseniz iki yıl boyunca ofis tutmak mümkün. Ve bunu bahsettiğimiz mobilite ve tekil çalışanları da düşünerekten birey olarak da artık bir ofis tutabiliyorsunuz. Küçük üç kişilik bir şirket olarak da bu konsepti kullanabiliyorsunuz. Ya da elli kişilik büyük şirketler olarak. Ama olay mekandan da öte. Ortak alanların önemini bahsettik. <gülüyor> Aslında bu e, konseptin en öne çıkan tarafı, daha demin gösterdiğim dört kişilik bir şirketin girdiği ofis değil. Dikkat ederseniz bir önceki resimde dört kişiyi 12 metrekareye oturttuk. Ve bu kişiler 12 metrekarenin faturasını ödüyor. Ama neden? Ortak olan, e, alanları ön plana taşıyorlar. Yani artık paylaşım ekonomisinden de getirdiği, psikolojik bir algısal değişimden ötürü paylaşmaya daha açığız. Ve bu yüzden bir yapı daha kolay bir şekilde şunu diyebiliyor, bilinçli. 30 kişiyim ben, 30 kişinin net çalışacağı bir alanı tutayım. Ortak alanlar ama normalde tutacağım, gene 4 kişi örneğinden diyelim ki 120 metrekarelik bir 2 artı 1'e geçmektense, 20 metrekarede oturup 100, 900 metrekare açık alan kullanımını kendime açmam. Yani bu ortak alanlarda çünkü Skype odaları var, telekonferans yapabileceğiniz toplantı odaları var, A plus şirketlerin yaptığı teknolojik altyapı var, interneti olsun, bahsettiğimiz gibi akıllı telefonla olan ilişkisi olsun, FNB'si olsun ya aslında hep bahsettiğimiz Google ofisi deriz. Aa hiç ulaşamayacağımız o Google ofisleri var ya. Coworking o konsepti çok da e, ulaşılabilir yapan yepyeni bir piyasa ve çok hızlı büyüyor. Ben de bu arada Collective House'un kurucu ortaklarındanım. Coworking de şu anda Türkiye'de bayrak almış ve bu piyasada öncü olmaya çalışan bir buçuk senelik bir şirket. Bu resimde bizim o sanayide ilk açtığımız ofisin etkinlik alanından Neil Karay İbrahim Gil'in girişimcilik hikayesinin anlatıldığı bir söyleşi. Yani aslında artık iş metrekare değil, bir hayat tarzı. Artık ofisi metrekareden çıkarıp Yeni bir e, motivasyon merkezine çevirmeye çalışıyoruz. Düşünün ki ofistesiniz, yoruldunuz. Artık çıkıp eve gitmekten başka hiçbir şey düşünmüyorsunuz. Ama alt katta çıkarken tesisin bir bölümünde, etkinlik alanında Neil Karay İbrahim gelmiş ve girişimci hikayesini anlatıyor. İçeride içki servisi var, F&B var. Belki orada yol üstünde bir yere gitmezdiniz ama orada bir 15 dakika, yarım saat oturup motivasyon, enerji toplayabilirdiniz. Sadece etkinlikler de yapmıyoruz. Piyasada çok görülen ve bizim de yaptığımız 
bazı güzel şeyler var. Geldiniz, danışmana ihtiyacınız var. Danışmanlık ihtiyacınız karşılamak için size destek veriyoruz. Valili masöz bile getiriyoruz ofise. Üç haftada bir. Üç, ve hemen şey, sürpriz bir şekilde giriyor ve tüm iyilerimize bir anda masaj hizmeti veriliyor. Bunlar küçük gözükse bile ve bir ekibimiz bunların devamını hep getirmek de e, sorumlu. İçerideki üyelerin inanılmaz bir motivasyon arttığını görüyoruz. Dünyada yapılan araştırmalar da Coworking alanlarında çalışmaya başlamış kişilerin performans ve verimliliklerinin ciddi oranda artıyor olması. <gülüyor> ve çok bebek bir trendden de bahsetmiyoruz. O yüzden tekrar dikkatinizi çekmek isterim. Sadece geçen yıl bu piyasaya 1 milyar dolar yatırım yapıldı. Bu şirketlerin şu anda çoğu Amerika'da ama dünyada, Avrupa'da da yayıldı ve dünyaya da çok hızlı bir şekilde yayıldığını görebiliyoruz. Diğer çok enteresan bir bilgi, şu anda bu alanlar dünya çapında 3 milyon metrekareye ulaştı. Yani geçen senenin verilerine bakarsak, e, benden çok daha iyi hakimsiniz bu rakamlara, İstanbul'da şu anda 4 milyon metrekareye yakın kiralanabilir ofis alanı var. Yani şu anda bir İstanbul dolusu insan bu ortak ofislerde çalışıyor. Tekrar hatırlıyorum, tohum bir trenden bahsetmiyoruz. Günümüzde şu anda yeni oluşan bir piyasa. Geçen yılda, yani son yıllara da baktığımızda da %36 oranında e, şu anda büyüme devam ediyor. Yani e, bu araştırmaların gösterdiği verimlilik artışı, anlattığım bu kulağa çok hoş gelen ama hayal olabilecek şeylerin gerçekliği yüzünden çok ciddi bir ilgi ve çok hızlı bir büyüme var. Önemli bir konu daha, bu işi gene soyutlamayalım. Bu iş sadece startuplar ya da gençler ve bu çok uzaktan baktığımız millenniallar için değil. Şu anda çok büyük şirketler, bu şirketleri hepiniz tanıyorsunuz. KPMG, PNG, PwC, AT&T, kendi sektörlerinde lider şirketler departmanlarını, inovasyon departmanlarını, belki daha büyük büyük departmanlarını kısa dönemli, uzun dönemli bir şekilde coworking space'lere taşıyorlar. Burada verdiğim örnekler de WeWork şu anda 17 milyar dolar değerlemeye ulaşmış ve bu sektörün dünya çapında birinci e, örneği. Noya House ise bu konsepti tamamen sanata vurmuş bir e, çerçeve. Yani aynı ofisi birazcık değiştirip biz sadece mimarlara, sadece sanatçılara diye dikey girişlerde yapabiliyorsunuz. Peki coworking'i nasıl yaklaşabiliriz? Bu konsepti nasıl benimseyebiliriz? Biraz ona da kapı aralamak isterim. Çünkü dediğim gibi yepyeni bir ofis anlayışından bahsediyoruz. İnsanların artık ofis tutmak, ofis yönetmek ve ofisle olan ilişkisinin tekrardan düzenlendiğinden bahsediyoruz. 2020 yılında dünyada genel pazara göre gene küçük bir pay olsa da 10 milyon metrekare Ortak ofis, co-working space açılmış olacak. Ve küçük bir e, parantez açmak istiyorum. Duyduğunuz serviced office ya da hazır ofis konseptinden başka bir piyasa, pazardan bahsediyoruz. Burada metrekarenin daha ön planda duran şey insani boyut. Yani bu kişilerin network etmesi. Şu anda bizim çıkardığımız bir application'da mevcut 250 üyemiz var. Çok yakında Levent'te açacağımız yerle beraber 650 üyeye geçiyoruz. Ve bunların hepsi size verdiğim YouTube örnekleri gibi çok inovatif işler yapan yapılar. Ve şimdi kurumların da dikkatini çektik. Hepinizin bileceği bazı kurumlar departmanlarını bize taşımak için bize ulaşıyorlar. Bu 650 kişinin içerideki bir app'te buluştuğunu düşünün ve konuşabildiğini, ihtiyaçlarını paylaşabildiğini, aslında o komşuluk, o iş hanı mantığını, eskilerde alışık olduğumuz, yenilenmiş bir versiyonu da diyebiliriz. Ve bizim için buradaki en önemli konu bu. Yani bir ofis tutuyorsunuz, düşünsenize, size iş bağlıyor. Ofis tutuyorsunuz, sizi sosyalleşmek isteyeceğiniz birisiyle tanıştırıyor. Google'da işte bu konuda destek arıyorum diye birisini bulmak yerine artık hepinize girip aynı çatı altında o 650 kişiden bir değer yaratma imkanı tanıyor. Ve birazcık teybi hızlı sararsak, diyelim ki 2000, WeWork örneğinde 40 bin üyeye çıktılar. Yani tek çatı, tek bir işanı diyelim ve 40 bin üyesi var. 
Yatırımcılar için de e, enteresan bir değer yaratıyor. Aslında işi gayrimenkul tarafından bakarsak, bu işin inovatif olması ve yeniliğe açık olmasından dolayı binaların aslında atıl kalan ve en düşük metrekare değer yaratabilecek yerleri komik bir şekilde bu ortak ofisler için ideal. Çünkü bu yapılar, bahsettik işte artık çok fazla satın alma yapmak istemiyorlar, markaları daha transparan görmek istiyorlar. Orada gerçekten yeni bir trendden bahsediyoruz. E bu aynı kişiler penthouse'a değer vermiyor. 40. katta durmanın onlara ekstra bir şey kattığını inanmıyor. Hatta 40 kat asansörde her gün beklemenin külfet olduğuna bile inanıyorlar. E şimdi o zaman e, altıl kalan yerlerde, yüksek tavanlı yerlerde, mesela bizim ilk tutan adresimiz sanayide. 17 komşumuzda e, motor rektifiye, araba tamir. Yani aslında böyle bir yerde bir ofis müessesinin ayağa kalkmasını düşünmezdiniz. Ama tekrardan bu millennial e, jenerasyonuna vurarsak işi bu mümkün. O yüzden... Bence gayrimenkul yatırım yapana herkesin de düşünmesi gereken yeni bir konsept. Nasıl bir kahve, bir e, renk katabiliyorsa bir binaya, düşünün ki bir alanında küçük bir alan bile ayrılsa, gençleri, bu yeni jenerasyonu ve bir marka algısını bu kitleye uyandırmak için çok güzel, çok verimli bir yol olabilir. Dinlediğiniz için teşekkür etmek istiyorum. E, Collective House olarak... Çok hızlı bir giriş yaptık ve dediğim gibi bu kültürü, yani işten çok bir kültürü genişletmek için elimizden geleni yapıyoruz. Merak uyandırdıysam kimseye sorularınız için her zaman bize ulaşabilirsiniz. Teşekkürler. <gülüyor> okay, thanks very much Ahmet. And first of all I'd like to thank you very much for saying so much on subject. I think you get the prize for saying metre kare more than anyone else here today. Um, a question for you. Uh, WeWork has recently launched a new co-living brand uh, in New York and Virginia called We Live. Do you think this is something that's interesting for you, something interesting for Turkey, and something that investors here in the room with mixed-use projects should be considering? Kesinlikle. Um, WeWork örneği, Türkçe başladım, Türkçe devam edeceğim. Şu anda dil değiştirmek zor olabilir. Um, WeWork örneği şu anda 400 bin metrekare yer açtılar son 7 yılda. Gerçekten çok ciddi bir e, case. Yani 7 yılda 400 bin metrekare açan inşaat şirket sayısı bile az. Tabii onlar yatırım yapmadıkları için çok daha hızlı büyüyebiliyorlar. Ama gene de operasyon olarak inanılmaz bir performans gösterdiler. Bu senede e, Call Living'e geçtiler. Yani anlattığım o güzel hayalperest dünyayı evlere nasıl sokarız? Yani 12 metrekare 4 kişi yerine şu anda diyelim ki 12 metrekare ya da 20 metrekarede tek kişilik ev yapıp gene ortak alanları baskın bir şekilde kullanarak çok fazla değer yaratmak. Biz Collective House olarak bunu çok yakında gireceğimiz bir piyasa olarak görüyoruz. Çünkü otellerde de Antony'nin bahsettiği gibi tüm alışkanlıklar yıkıldı ve bu evlere de taşınacak. Yani markalaşmış binalar, gençlerin alım güçleri arttıkça tercih edeceği binalar olacak. O yüzden Tony cevap vermek gerekirse çok yakında biz de Türkiye'de umarım ki diğer markalarla beraber Co Living bayrağını taşıyorken göreceksin. Thank you very much. And finally, finally I would like to present Mr. Ibrahim Ibrahim. He trained as an aeronautical engineer but has found his niche now in the very specialist and interesting field of branding and retail design. I had the privilege of hearing him uh, talk last year, and he has some very thought-provoking ideas on the future of retail that I think will be of great interest to developers and operators here today. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you to Fison for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I have a team in London who are twittering, tweeting and Instagramming on the hashtag of the, of the conference. And so please follow and please get into a debate with them and disagree with them. I'd be really happy if you can do that. So today's changes in retail are not cyclical. There's no going back. They're structural. The changes in retail are seismic. And these are driven not from architecture, but through changing relationships between customers and brands. So hello. My name is Ibrahim and my business is Portland. We design brands and places for people. We're a branding and strategic design agency, but everything we do is driven through understanding shoppers 
and their engagement with brands and branded environments. And we have a couple of mantras in our business, people and places, not buildings and spaces. For us, the future of retail is not about architecture. It's about understanding that shift between the physicality of space and the emotion of place. How do we create real, unique sense of place in our retail environments? And the second mantra we have is, ultimately, we're in the business of storytelling. We create, craft stories, and translate those into engaging customer experiences. And everything we do is about future-proofing. How do we future-proof your business? And that is becoming very, very critical in this new and fast-changing retail landscape. And for us, the retail future is not about technology. It's about anthropology. It's about understanding how people live and how they engage with brands. And we don't refer to them as millennials or Generation X or Generation Y. We refer to them as Generation C. This is not about demographics or age. It's about interests and behaviors. Generation C have one key demand, and that is control. They demand control in everything they do. Whether that control is about hyper-simplicity and convenience in their shopping, or whether it's about transparency in the brand. Ask VW about transparency, and they'll understand that customers have control. And the other aspects of Generation C is they are, of course, constantly connected. They demand the ability to collaborate with brands, and very importantly, collaborate with each other. They co-create. They want to shape a brand. They want to be part of a brand. They build communities, communities where the brand is at the center, the fulcrum of that community. And of course, they have a conscience. They care not just what they're going to buy from a brand or from a shop or a shopping center. They care about the role that brand plays in their lives and in a wider world. They have a conscience. And for them, participation is the new consumption. They want to be part of the experience. They don't just care about transaction, about buying and selling. And in future, the winners in retail will do four things. Firstly, they'll reinvent convenience. In this increasing transient lives our consumers lead, they demand shopping in every part of their life. They demand engagement with brands in, along their very, very rapidly increasing um, and, and, and complicated customer journey. The customer journey is no longer in the shop or in the shopping center. It's before and after. It's increasingly digitized. And therefore, it's a demand for more and more convenience and simplicity. We call it hyper-convenience. The second thing the winners will do is redefine loyalty. Loyalty will no longer be about earn and burn, about points and discounts. Loyalty will be about creating fantastic digital platforms where you give increasingly customized, personalized service to your customers through these, through these platforms that are based on true and deep engagement with brands. So the future of loyalty is about engaging and involving, not discounting and transacting. The third thing the winners will do is reimagine the experience. I told you that our business is about storytelling. We actually don't believe that. The future is not about storytelling. It's about story doing. It's not just about communication. It's about creating participatory experiences. I mean, look at these brands, Peroni, Vans. Vans is a, is a, is a sneaker brand. They're not selling anything in these shops. They're creating fantastic experiences, not where you buy the brand, but where you buy into the brand. Their transaction model is not a shop. Their transaction model happens somewhere else. So if you're a shopping center, and you've increasingly got brands and tenants whose primary role of a shop is not transaction, where does that leave your model? This is about curated destinations, where increasingly 
categories are being blurred. Fashion stores with coffee shops, fashion stores with patisseries, a, a blurring of art and fashion, art and retail, constant blurring. Does that mean the future of a shop is a concrete box with a glass front on a five-year lease? Is it? How many fashion stores do you have with drainage and with extraction to meet the needs of a retailer that wants to have food and beverage in their shop? And there's new players. Future tenants will increasingly not be retailers. They may be pure players. Again, pure players from online brands. They may not want shops to transact. Their transact and logistics model, their delivery, their fulfillment model is elsewhere. It's not in the shop or in the shopping center. But they still want shops. They still want physical shops. How, as a landlord, are you going to deliver to those shops and deliver to these brands? As I said, they may not want a concrete box. They may want, I don't know, a container in your car park or, or a banana on your roof. Who knows? They've changed the game. They've shifted the discussion. They've shifted the dialogue. And pure players are not the only ones that are looking at shops as a physical channel. Media brands, broadcast brands, what kind of shops are these guys going to have? Are they going to be in what you call tenanted space? Are they going to work with a 70-30 gross to net? It's a question. The future, really, is about soft space, programmable space, fluid space. It's not about fixed architecture. It's about brands that want to be here today, gone tomorrow, want to create wonderful experiences to engage brands and tell their stories, not just to buy and sell. Buying and selling can happen somewhere else increasingly in the future. Whether that, that programmability of a shop is to do with digital. Increasingly, we can use digital not as iPads. If I had a pound for every client that said to me, I want iPads in my shop, I'd be a millionaire. You know, Digital is about creating new moods and new interfaces. The future of shops, and we say to clients often, you need to start thinking about hiring editors-in-chief and stage managers, not property managers. Think of your shop as a stage, your shopping center as a stage. Be a space curator, not a filler of shelves and a filler of shops. Increasingly, fantastic experiences are being developed around this idea of, of programmed experiential space. Of course, the ultimate aim is to sell customers stuff and services and products. Indeed, of course it is. But that isn't what drives it. It's about one space with many moods. The fourth thing the winners will do is reposition value. What is the value? What value do you give to these new consumers, these consumers that think in a very different way? By new, I don't mean young. I mean a new mindset. Well, consumers have an increasing thirst for knowledge and learning. No longer do they think about status symbols. The new status is status skills. It's the story, it's the skill involved in buying the product or service. They increasingly want the unexpected, the unknown. That's exciting shopping. The ephemeral, here today, gone tomorrow. The imperfect, too many shops, too many shopping centers are too hard, too architectural. They're not human, not human scale. How many shopping centers are I seeing with soaring staircases and big glass lifts? It's not an airport, this is a shopping center. These are community centers. They've got to be human. Customers are abandoning ubiquity. They're abandoning cookie-cutter shopping, cookie-cutter shopping centers. How many shopping centers have I been here in many other countries? The same brands in the same locations, the same frontages, the same products. They want customization, personalization, not just in, in, in, in the product they buy, but in everything. And digital can be a fantastic way of delivering great personalization. Because the future of retail is live. It's a living, breathing, organic experience. Whether that's about events, demonstrations, learning, classes, whether it's broadcast, the media, whether it's entertainment and performance. This is a mobile phone shop. Or conviviality and sociability. This is Lowe's in America. They've got 220,000 members of their female DIY club. They meet every Saturday. They don't sell anything on a Saturday. 
It's about buying into the brand, not just buying the brand. And of course, story from New York, where the, the, the shop changes every month. This is not about high, high price fit out of a shop that lasts for seven years. The shop fit out is very low capex and changes every month completely. It's not a shop, it's a stage, a stage for shopping. So the future of retail is not in a box. And we talk a lot about the demise of the demise. I'm sorry about the terminology, but in English, demise has two meanings. Demise means death, but it also means a line, a demise line between the shop and the street. And we are saying there's a death of that line, a death of that line at the very micro level, i.e. between categories. No more, do shopping, shopping, no more do shoppers shop with fashion, coffee, books, electronics. We're no longer shopping through categories. These are blurring the death of the line between categories. The death of the line between the shop and the shopping mall. The death of this line, this glass line, more integration, blurring, softening between tenanted and public realm. And very importantly, the death of the line between the shopping center and community. Long gone are the days where we'll be dropping hermetically sealed boxes that turn their back on our communities. Shopping centers that are part of the urban grain, the urban landscape, that connect, connect to community, connect to life not an air-conditioned box outside ordinary life, more human. That's the demise of the demise, from micro-scale to macro-scale. Brands creating entertainment in shopping. This is Johnny Walker. Brands that are blurring music, coffee, food, shopping, all in one space in Harrods. So retailers need to stop thinking about making shopping entertaining and concentrate on making entertainment shoppable. Start with the entertainment. Whatever that entertainment is, whatever that story is, and make it shoppable. Monetize the footfall. And we talk a lot about the life cycle of shopping centers. Excuse me for a second. We talk about the life cycle of shopping centers. You know, and then shopping centers started in, in the weather protection business. They started down here. They just used to protect, protect customers from the weather. And then they progressed and they got into property and leasing. And then they progressed and they said, okay, we've got to have fashion here and electronics here and food here. And we start thinking like retailers and retail. And then they realized, damn, this is not about shopping. This is about entertainment and leisure. It can't just be about shopping. And that's where most of the good ones are. Still, some of them are down here. But that game has changed. What shopping centers will be in the future are media platforms where the landlords will monetize footfall. Because if there's less and less shops that are buying and that are selling things and taking money through tills, what they are are media platforms. So a shopping center has got to behave like a media platform increasingly because data is the new oil, and that will allow them, data will allow them to act like a media brand, because they'll have the data, the very, very detailed data of who's visiting that shopping center, what is their profile, what is their preference, who are they? And they can absolutely monetize that data. That's a, brand, that's a media brand. Amazon is not a retail brand, Amazon is a media brand. It monetizes its footfall. And we've got the technology to be able to really analyze through many types of technology where people are moving and how they're behaving in, short, in store. So as Mariam Saltzman said in her fantastic book, Next Now, this is the era of the surprising, the spontaneous, the unplanned, and the serendipitous, happy coincidences. How do you bring happy coincidences? If you can give a customer a happy coincidence, it's the most powerful experience they can have. They didn't think that anyone planned that experience. It just happened. I discovered it. Shops and shopping centers must be serendipity machines. Because it's no longer just about sales per square meter. It's about ideas per square meter. Engagement, senses, how many surprises per square meter? Can you measure how many surprises you have? How often is your shop or your shopping center changing? Or is it a lovely piece of architecture on day one, 
and three years later, it's the same piece of architecture. How much delight? How many smiles per square meter? That's the slide for this presentation. That's the slide for this conference. Per square meter, what are the new metrics? Because it's no longer enough to do slightly better than before. Slightly shinier shops, slightly nicer marble, slightly nicer staircase and elevators, slightly nicer facades on our shopping center. The future success will be determined by rethinking and reimagining what customers' relationships with shops and shopping centers are and the role they play in our communities. Because in future, successful shops will speak like a magazine, will change like a gallery, will sell like a shop, will share like an app, will build loyalty like a club, and will entertain like a show. Because safe is risky. Never forget, in retail, safe is risky. Be remarkable. Get your customers to remark, to talk about your brand, to share your stories. And do you know, in this world, there are three types of people, three types of business leaders, and three types of retailer. Those who make it happen, those who let it happen, and those who wondered what happened. Don't wonder what happened when the world changes if you're in retail. Get future ready. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Some pretty radical ideas there, as you promised. And if they're implemented, they'll have a fundamental effect on mall owners, mall designers, and mall leases. How do you think the hardware and the buildings might change? Should we be all building, be, sorry, should we all be building giant loft spaces, one space, many moods? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a multifaceted question and multifaceted answer. But I think the fundamental question one needs to ask oneself is this 70-30, 60-40 net to growths. What is the proportion of tenanted space and public realm? Once we've answered that question, what is public realm? And what can we do with public realm? Is the future, and I saw a shopping centre recently that isn't actually opening until October, and it has six metre malls, five metre, six metre mall, mall, mall walkways. What's happening with public realm? How are we beginning to treat public realm um, as programmed space? And how does it start blurring with a talented space? And how does it become one fantastic experience? And how do we start really blurring and blending the categories? How do we integrate? We've been talking for years about the integration of F&B in retail. And that is becoming a really, really critical, critical aspect of, I think, the planning of, of, of shopping centers. Um, and, of course, digital is, is a big part of that. But digital, in terms of how it affects the whole environment and how people can engage with digital, that's really, really critical. And the third thing is data. How do we capture the data, both digitally, in, in terms of how customers respond in, in social platforms, but very importantly, physically, how can we capture the data in shopping centers, understand where people are moving, where they're, where they're circulating. More importantly, which shops are they looking at? Are they, are they going inside, outside the shops? What are they doing? We can capture all that data. Behave like a media brand. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> and very many thanks also to Anthony and to Amit for sharing their vision with us here today. I do hope we've jointly given you, the audience, some food for thought, as well as some useful, perhaps even provocative and scary insights. Thank you all for coming. Happiness is a safe giver. Sagasunior, Igor Nash. <laughs>